Welcome if you're new or welcome back. It's good to see you today. My name is Vix and this is my channel Goddess of Gore where I like to talk about horror, thriller, fantasy and sci-fi books. Today I want to tell you about the four books I read last week. Well, I was on holiday and the two I haven't finished yet. Let's get on with the books and you'll see. The first book I finished was Lockwood & Co book three, The Hollow Boy by Jonathan Stroud. I had started this at the end of last week and at the time of filming I had seen the news that the Netflix show won't be getting a second series which is such a shame because I thought it was a pretty good spooky show for older kids and adults alike. But these are the choices of those with the money I guess. Anyway, the book, as I said last week, I felt like the books were getting better and better as it's going on. The characters are getting more dimensional and this is probably my favourite so far. This is the third book in the series and we catch up with the small psychic detection agency not far after book two ended. So a little background context if you haven't heard of these books. Ghosts are running rife through the country like a virus or an epidemic or whatever. So during certain hours of the day, the whole of the UK is under curfew. Or I guess it's a venture at your own risk because ghosts can kill you just by touching you. What they imaginatively call ghost touched. Whoever they touch goes into a coma and potentially dies. Adults cannot see the ghost and therefore at the most risk. All children can see ghosts, but only some gifted children have the skills to eradicate them. And these are sought after by the detection agencies. Lockwood & Co is a very small agency with just three operatives and therefore, although getting great achievements, they're not as popular as the bigger agencies with hundreds of kids. And so going on that, when London is plagued with a huge cluster of ghosts and an entire section of the city is evacuated, Lockwood and co are not invited to take part in the extermination. But that's okay, Lockwood, Lucy and George will pick up all the smaller jobs of the house hauntings that the big guys are now too busy to work on. So, while being overworked and tired, picking up these jobs, they make a boo-boo, a big mistake. They didn't have time to research the job properly, they need extra help. And that's where Holly comes in. Super organised, she gets the threesomes diaries planned to perfection, taking phone calls from clients about hauntings and deciding if it is actually worth their time. She really is helpful. But Lucy doesn't like her. Not one bit. So the so-called Chelsea outbreak, the huge cluster of ghosts hanging around and baffling the big crews, is still refusing to let Lockwood and co in to help. But of course, George, with, with his amazing detective skills, gets some clues to what is causing it and the gang thinks something is to blame at a big, at a big department store. There's a particularly spooky ghost in that store that even made me go. So I heartily recommend this series so far. If you want a bit of light-hearted, hearted, spooky fun or know any younger people who like a scare, it is a five book series, which I think has actually concluded. Then it was the turn of the first day of spring by Nancy Tucker. Oh my God, this book. What the hell? It was perfect. I absolutely loved it so much. An eight-year-old killed a two-year-old and she loves the feeling. It flits from Chrissy, who did the killing and Lucy the woman she became when she got out of prison. She has had to move location a few times and change her name as the press has caught up with her each time. She has a daughter, Molly, who she continually thinks is going to be taken off her by social services and she is continually comparing herself to other mothers by giving herself a scoring point system. Her own mother was very strange. She just sat in her room daily crying or she was not there at all. But with each page you are given more information into little Chrissy's life. 
raised with no food or electricity, getting all her food at school and equally not being cared for at school by her teachers, even though it was very obvious that she isn't being looked after at home, such as wetting the bed, smelling of wee and unwashed skin, dirty clothes, not being washed and bathed, not being fed except for her school dinners. All her mother does is go to church, but where does she go to at night? I wanted to finish this book in one go. Damn my sleepy eyes. I had a conflicting sense of repulsion that I had to find out what the hell happened to Chrissy before she went to prison. Oh my God, what a book. I loved it. It's completely bingeable and so easy to read. The complicated yet simple thinking of the eight-year-old killer, like her thought process made so much sense at how unfair her life was. And the smartest scene, <sighs> her mother must have had some kind of undiagnosed form of Munchausen's or something because she was starving that child, trying to get rid of her all the time. I mean, what? How can people treat others like this? I mean, I know we as a species are messed up, but... I felt like this was such a real story too, like this was actually something that had happened. So it's basically a book about an eight year old who from the first sentence tells you she has killed someone. Each chapter is told from a different perspective as each of the people she has been from Chrissy, the girl, to each of the new identities she has been since her release from juvenile prison or the institution she was in. This is also a story of how Chrissy was 100% failed by a lot of people. Oh, and it's the author's debut fiction book too, having already wrote a memoir about her struggles with her own eating disorder. And then, finally, I got to reading The Haunting of Alejandra by V. Crastro. Oh dear. I don't want to trash a book by V. Castro, so I'm going to do this as gentle as I can. This was repetitive, padded out, in my opinion, badly written, that would have been a million times better as a novella. The actual premise was good. A generational haunting by one of Mexico's infamous ghost legends to the failed women throughout a family's history. A vision of La Llorona showing up during pregnancy or when the women are feeling particularly low or useless, begging them to kill themselves or give her their children and all your bad feelings will go away. The trouble was, Alejandra was not very relatable to me. She was a stay-at-home mom to three kids. She didn't appear to enjoy the wealth and austerity she was surrounded by. She had endless credit on her credit card she drove a fancy car had a fridge brimming with food not to mention a six bedroom house in a beautiful town she just didn't like cooking she literally thought about death and killing herself all the time i just didn't vibe with this woman she didn't like taking care of her kids she didn't like her husband she didn't like it when her husband was at home she also didn't like it when her husband was at work or working away which he did all the time the humdrum day-to-day -day life of alejandra was so contradicting she literally hated every one of her kids one minute and then when she was talking to someone else you'd think she adored and doted on them her husband, Matthew, did talk to her like she was the nanny sometimes, though. So he was a little dickless man baby in that respect. But it was like, he wouldn't let me do this. He had to be in control. And then I got rid of all the boring, boring decor and he came home and I went, Hey, babe, where's all the boring decor? Oh, you boring piece of crap. I filled the house with bright colours and artwork of the people from my heritage. And he would be like, oh, cool. I mean, he just wanted a fucking sandwich. And then it's like, he doesn't do a thing as a family man. And then he literally baths and puts his kids to bed every night when he's at home. Like, what? There's 
thousands of women with some knobhead at home who was smoking weed and drinking beer and playing on a bloody Xbox that would swap places with this monster Matthew any day. Anyway, this was a Mexican-American folklore book with a not very likeable to me main character who's moany, whiny, was very annoying and I hated how everything worked out for her in, for her in the end. And as I said, it would have worked as a novella and it would have been better without the padding. And I'm really sorry, but I didn't enjoy it. But shout out to Alex Ekman Law for this front cover. Bravo. So next I pulled out of the TBR jar, the Witcher book, The Contempt of Time, which I'm still reading. My interest has waned a little on this, but so far this has been about Yennefer and Geralt at a banquet where he declares his love for her at last. And they go and have groundbreaking sex. Obviously, no one ever has bad sex in books, do they? I am currently halfway through and not much has really happened. And then because my interest was waning a little on The Witcher, I pulled out another title from my little jar and I pulled out Bethany Chiller. And I'm so glad I got this one out of the way because you know how it had low points on Goodreads and Storygraph. Yeah, seems I agree with them. So the story is that for the days leading up to Bethany's 16th birthday, she has been feeling like someone has been watching her, standing behind her, but whenever she turns around and has a look, there's nobody there. Well, on the night of her actual birthday, Halloween night, Bethany and her friend go to the school disco and then into a friend of Michelle's house party. Well, deciding at the last minute to have a few alcoholic drinks, Bethany ends up getting a little tipsy and losing her friend. As she stumbles through the stranger's house, she comes upon four lads in her room. She thinks they're messing around by not letting her out, but immediately turns it turns nefarious and she ends up being brutally sexually assaulted by all of them. After they leave the room, she gets up the nerve to leave the house and tries her best to get herself home. Anyway, after that ordeal, she soon discovers that a demon, called Amy, has befriended her and she said she has been watching her and waiting for her to step in and get revenge for the assault. Obviously, Bethany doesn't say no. The premise sounds like a good revenge story, but I didn't enjoy the build up to Bethany's assault. I feel like Steve Deegan over-sexualised the teenagers from descriptions of their bodies and the thoughts in their head. I just think it took me out of the story. I mean, I guess that the attack itself was handled reasonably well. There was no messing about with the descriptions in that scene. The blokes were gross and it was written well. It was just everything else. And I'm still getting through the Fellowship of the Ring, reading a chapter every day or so. I won't be doing any more reviewing for this book since it's now over halfway and all I will be doing is spoiling it for you if you haven't read it already. So I know that I'm on the chapter called The Meeting at Elrond. So that's it. A pretty productive week of reading. A couple of good, a couple of bad book choices for me, I think. Let me know how your week went or how your month is going so far. I really want to know what you're up to. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching and spending your time with me today. I really appreciate that. Don't forget to like it if you did and subscribe if you haven't already and want to stick around for a little longer. I will leave you as always, with a book quote from something I've read this week. So that was all it took, I thought. That was all it took for me to feel like I had all the power in the world. One morning, one moment, one yellow-haired boy. It wasn't so much after all. Make some good book choices this week, my friends, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until uh, next time, bye-bye. Uh,